Hi, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about Emperor and about how um, you can use it with some of the existing data structures in, say, Scikit-Bio, or maybe even with a Pandas data frame um, if you think this sort of analysis and visualization is suitable for, for your work. Um, so um, I'm going to first motivate why we use beta diversity. What is beta diversity in the context of uh, the microbiome or in the context of microbial ecology? Uh, then what is Semper, how it originated, and then moving on to how it is that you can use Semper right now. And finally, a really simple ex example of some of the things that we can do with um, the new developments that we've been working on. So uh, let's, let's start by motivating um, why do we use beta diversity. So turns out uh, we are, if you're not familiar with these, we're covered with microbes. There's a whole lot of diversity living on and in our bodies. And these amazing, uh, 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 I like to call them precision machines, are doing tremendous tasks that your body would otherwise not be able to do. So for example, in this beautiful picture, you can see uh, a bunch of microbes uh, digesting some of the fiber that your body would just absolutely not be able to di digest. Now, there's a problem. We have a lot of microbes in our bodies, and these sort of interactions um, between these communities are rather complex. And with the drops in sequencing costs, or with the drops in costs to generate this data, we're just generating more and more information. So it's always useful to find a good way to sort of summarize and like measure um, the differences between um, samples and between uh, the communities in, say, my god compared to somebody else's god, or um, uh, the microbiome of the floor in this uh, in this room to the microbiome in the tap water. Um, so the way beta diversity works is that we start off with um, uh, this data uh, uh, or core data structure or this um, matrix that represents uh, the different biological specimens on the columns and the different microbes that are present in those uh, in those samples on the rows. So this is, uh, a, a, a every single element in this matrix has the number of microbes that are present for a particular kind in each of the samples present in your table. So as you can imagine, when this table has a sizable uh, number of uh, microbes and a sizable number of uh, samples, you're going to end up with something rather unintelligible. So what we usually do is compare each of these two samples by using a distance metric. I'm sure you may be familiar with distance functions, so I'm not going to go into the detail about that. But what you generate is this distance matrix that's a symmetric and hollow matrix that uh, allows you to summarize the differences between the samples present in, um, in your uh, table. With these matrix, we use dimensionality reduction techniques that helps us, uh, that help us bring uh, these high dimensional data into a reduced uh, space. So in this case, uh, two dimensions. And it really is not super helpful to just look at the data as it is, like look at the ordinated coordinates. But it's really when you actually use the additional information that you collect with, uh, along with your samples that you can make sense out of uh, the data. So what we're seeing here is uh, the different clustering of body sites from different uh, human subjects. And what we see is that the um, gut samples cluster together, the oral sample cl samples cluster together, and that the, the differences between the, these sites are uh, very, uh, very strong, or so strong, that even an unsupervised learning um, algorithm like principal coordinates analysis can tease these uh, differences out. And it's really more when you uh, start using other sample metadata that you can explore uh, these differences or the impact or, or the magnitude that these biological effects have. So for example, like we saw, um, body habitat has a really strong uh, effect on the differences between the, the communities in the samples, but something like sex or the subject that uh, donated the sample 
are not nearly as big of a difference uh, when you compare it to the body habitat. So Emperor is exactly that. Emperor will allow you to visualize these sort of matrices and interact and use the metadata uh, within your ordination. Because we, when you don't do that, if you just have your coordinates, so what I'm loading here is an ordination results object from scikit-bio. So this is just uh, the, um, the ordinated distance matrix into a small dimensional space. And I'm loading uh, additionally a pandas data frame with the metadata. So the metadata on itself is really just a table that relates uh, every single one of the samples to different biological annotations. And um, the coordinates themselves are also not very informative like uh, we saw before, but if we use something like Emperor to visualize these two at the same time and sort of um, uh, so, sort of makes sense out of what, what is it that we are seeing, we can start reproducing some of the things like we saw before. So Emperor is this uh, JavaScript user interface uh, that's powered by a Python API. So what you're seeing um, here uh, is the Emperor user interface. And what I can do now with this interface is start navigating through my um, metadata or through my data frame, and I can look for something like body habitat. And now I can uh, color each of the cluster by the body, uh, each of the samples, sorry, by the body habitat uh, where that sample was collected from, and we see the same pattern that we saw before. But one of the cool things is that you can also change uh, the different color maps like you would, for example, in Seaborn or in Matplotlib, except here you do it interactively. So now let's say um, we want to use the, uh, this um, color map or this color scheme and that we now want to hide all the samples um, from the male subjects. So we do that, and now all the samples are hidden from the ordination. And in this same way, you can have orthogonal control of all of these different metadata categories in your ordination, in the browser, and interactively, which we think is of a lot of value, because most of the times, these analyses start as an exploratory, um, as uh, are very exploratory in nature. Sorry. Um, finally, uh, another thing you would be, uh, uh, you can do if you're familiar with ordinations or dim dimensionality reduction techniques, is to look at your scrape plot. So this is a scrape plot that uh, summarizes the percentage of variation for each of the. Um, each of the axes in your ordinated coordinates. So we can even swap out the different dimensions. Say you want to move uh, the fifth principal uh, coordinates axis to be the first axis. So you can do that in the browser, and you can still see a little bit of separation by body side. So again, we're trying to embrace the fact that um, the, the, Jupyter, uh, uh, inter, uh, the Jupyter Notebook provides interactivity, and we want to make this tool very interactive. So now that you saw the demo, and uh, I'm, ho I I'm hoping that now you're convinced that Emperor is useful, what, what, what's Emperor exactly? Well, Emperor is this Python 2 and Python 3 uh, Python package that's powering this JavaScript user interface. It really originated in the context of Chime, the pipeline that um, Emperor talked about, uh, Emperor, that Greg talked about uh, in his previous talk. And um, uh, the, the idea was that Emperor was only going to replace one script out of the 150 existing or, uh, scripts in Chime. But what ended up happening is that we sort of um, realized this was a, uh, a, a rather nice way to explore um, data and to share these visualizations with others. So um, it really is noble from the integration with Chime. Um, and before I move uh, forward, I, I want to remind you that Emperor is really just a scatterplot viewer. There's nothing that ties Emperor to ordinations or to dimensionality reduction techniques or even to biology. So it's really just an interactive scatterplot viewer. Um, like I was saying, uh, with the integration with Chime, we were sort of able to realize a few other applications. 
So we ended up um, working in uh, a project called Cheetah that allows you to share, store, and analyze microbiome data. And one of the analysis tools that you can use in Cheetah is Emperor. And similarly, in these crowdsourced and crowdfunded um, citizen science project, uh, the American God project, uh, participants would get the results back uh, in the form of emperor plots. And there's a few other examples, uh, and one of my favorite ones is that we try to develop an IPython notebook interface back, back when it was still the IPython notebook interface, and I say kinda, because when we were actually, um, when we actually got to develop it, we found that there were a lot of glitches with our CSS, so what would happen is that you would instantiate your plot and the plot would uh, incessantly grow and we, like, uh, we couldn't figure it out and the issues is still open in NB Viewer. Um, but now, <laughs> now things are much better. Now <laughs> you, you didn't see the plot scale infin infinitely. So now, now things are much better. So, we have a Python API, and we think it's a nice API, but to be honest, this is the first time we're trying to push forward for a stable, uh, stable API that other people can use. So we would appreciate your feedback if you realize that there's a quintessential missing component from this, uh, from this interface. We try to integrate, or and I think we succeeded in integrating really nicely with Scikit-Bio and Jupyter, and we are now moving on to being able to uh, um, interface with Pandas data frames, because I think uh, everyone at this conference is using Pandas data frames in, uh, in one way or another. And as a consequence of being able to provide a robust Python API, we sort of realized that we had to provide a solid, or we had to have a solid JavaScript API. And um, finally, as a consequence of uh, the developments of Chime 2, like we now don't even have to develop a command line interface. We uh, get one for free um, by, using, uh, by creating a plugin for Chime 2. So now, how can you use Emperor? Well, Emperor can be imported as a, uh, as a native Python object. Uh, I'm sure you will be familiar with the NumPy doc standard, so we try to use the NumPy uh, doc standard and you can uh, see some of these examples right, right from the console. Or you can go to our website and uh, navigate through the documentation that we also have uh, online. Um, like I was saying before, if you are not uh, working with microbiome data, or dimensionality reduction techniques. You can really just use whatever data frame. And so I wanna say, uh, <laughs> I wanna make sure uh, it's very clear that this is a very experimental uh, sort of interface, so feedback is greatly appreciated. But what we are gonna do here is just load a, um, a Pandas data frame. If you are familiar with the tips data set, this is just uh, summarizing um, different variables for uh, tips that were um, given at, at, at a particular restaurant. So this is just a regular data frame. And what we have in Emperor is these, uh, oh, geez. Um, uh, is this new interface, this scatterplot function, where if you pass a pandas data frame to, um, to this function, what Emperor is gonna do is take out all the numeric columns from your data frame and use those to uh, position the samples in, uh, in the plotting space. So it's just gonna try to infer how to best create a plot out of your data. Um, so like we saw before, this is just numeric data and some categorical data. That categorical data is gonna be used as the addi additional metadata to your, uh, to your samples. So for example, I can now zoom in. I can change the color to something like sex or um, maybe whether or not they were smokers. I can rotate, pan around, and really uh, 
change whatever uh, whatever the it is that I want to change according to the metadata because really it, it is the metadata that uh, makes a lot of these things possible so for example I can also even change uh, the shape of for example uh, males and make them cubes and maybe I want to make uh, I want to make those cubes a little bit bigger so I want to go to sex and male and increase the size now we have uh, a nice plot nice in quotes <laughs> um, so you can also uh, like, like we've uh, like we've seen this is really all running in the Jupyter notebook um, and you too can use this in uh, in the notebook you can use this by sharing uh, a notebook on NB viewer by running your own server or if you wanted to detach from the notebook and just generate a standalone HTML plot that you want to host in one of your websites, we also provide an interface and support uh, uh, for that sort of use case from the Python up to the JavaScript level. So uh, these are sort of the, the ways that we're trying to make sure uh, these things work. And in particular, with JavaScript, I know this is um, SciPy, but I, I think that by um, going through this journey of creating a JavaScript API and a set of JavaScript objects, uh, especially for us that we were not very familiar with um, this sort of development environment, it really opened up uh, a lot of doors. And it, it like, and I refer, I, I mean creative doors. Like this is a, a whole new way to um, express and interact with your data. So I think it's very powerful. Uh, to do this and to sort of explore this, even uh, this space, even if you're just a, a if you're, even if you're a Python developer and not a JavaScript developer, we're very proud that our JavaScript um, API is thoroughly unit tested, which is not usually the case of JavaScript objects, and that we also have a really nice documentation for APIs, so you can go to the website and explore the the set of objects that we have and see if these would fit you. And maybe you want to build a emperor interface for Julia that you want to be able to use uh, in a different environment. You would be able because um, the JavaScript interface is well documented, or so we hope. So one of the nice things that having um, these, um, this API, um, one of the things that was possible because of this API was integration with Sage2. Sage2 is these, uh, this system or this platform for displaying information in multi-tile displays. So those huge video walls where you see um, 20 or 30 uh, full HD displays arranged as tiles, they are usually running Sage. And I'm really sorry that I didn't get a better picture out of this, but <laughs> you have to take my word that that is Emperor running uh, in a Sage 2 platform back at UCSD on a 32, um, um, tile display. It, this is a huge theater and the entire thing is running and it just works because it's JavaScript and uh, Sage 2 is written in JavaScript. So that was a nice thing. Um, one of the last things that I uh, want to mention before I move out uh, to a demo is that with, the, with Chime 2, a lot of um, development burden was taken, uh, taken off of our shoulders because um, like I mentioned before, Emperor originated as a command line interface. So we had to provide a command line interface for new, uh, our new API. Uh, but after working uh, with Greg and his group for around one and a half hours, we were able to get this plugin that made it possible to, for users to get a command line interface to Emperor, to get a GUI, and really uh, a bunch of other things that uh, it's up to developer and uh, interface developers of the Chime 2 framework that we may be able to get just for free because we're using this uh, awesome framework. And the really important part that I, that I left out is provenance tracking. So now uh, you will know where, where your plot is coming from, where that data is coming from. So I, I think that's very important nowadays. Uh, specifically because we're having so, uh, so many issues um, with uh, reproducibility. And 
I would really encourage you to try Chime 2 as a gateway to an expanded user interface, uh, user base, and um, like uh, you can browse the 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 source on uh, Q2 Emperor under the Chime 2 organization, and now we don't have to maintain a command line interface, so that's pretty great. That's uh, <laughs> less development for us. Um, so finally, I'm going to move on to a very simple use case. So um, this example is motivated by a project that I worked on uh, right after I graduated from my undergrad. Back then, this was probably four or five years ago, and the tools were just not quite there, and uh, to be honest, we were not so well versed on um, what was available in the scientific Python stack. So in this use case, I'm gonna try to use as much as possible everything that we have available in this awesome community. We're gonna create a small interface to subsample one of these tables, to randomly subsample it, compute a distance matrix, and then ordinate the coordinates, everything interactively. And if you're familiar with the field, you may remember that a subset or a, um, that Evident uh, was a project that was capable of doing all these, but being a developer of Evident, I know that the development burden associated with being able to do these few tasks was extremely large, extremely tedious, and not very maintainable. So let's see uh, how we do with, uh, by leveraging the scientific Python stack. So first, we do a lot of imports. We're gonna import from Pandas, from Scikit-learn, from the Jupyter Widgets uh, framework, from Scikit-bio, from Biome. We're just gonna le uh, leverage all the technology that we have available. So these are just imports. And we're gonna create a helper function to parse our metadata and uh, hide all the warnings, because otherwise you would not be able to see anything. Um, and first, we load our feature table, so that's uh, the OTU table, and our metadata. Then we're gonna load a phylogenetic tree using scikit-bio. And after this finishes loading, we're gonna declare this function that's gonna first subsample the features. Then it's gonna compute a uh, distance matrix over the entire table. And finally, it's going to compute the, um, the principal coordinates analysis of that distance matrix to later be displayed in Emperor. Uh, as you can see very, um, uh, very carefully here, we are using scikit-learn's per, uh, pairwise uh, distances um, function. And what this allows us to do is to use um, more distance metrics than just the ones available, say, in scikit-bio. So let's execute this. And now, uh, to finish off, we're just gonna use the Jupyter interact uh, function. So if you're not familiar, what we are declaring here is the type of interfaces that we wanna have available. First, we want some sort of um, widget that allows us to scroll through a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of numbers in this range with these steps, and that allows us to select from these uh, different options, and we're just set, setting manual to true to make sure that we uh, provide confirmation before anything starts executing. So this is gonna give us these few controllers, and what we're gonna do is, let's say, first subsample uh, at 1,200 uh, features per sample, and select the unweighted unifract matrix, uh, metric, sorry. And now we run this. So what's gonna happen is that because we're using scikit-learn's uh, compute pairwise distances, um, these computations are gonna be distributed onto my eight cores, and as soon as they are done, they're gonna be sent back, uh, showed into the Emperor object, and be presented on screen. These took us, I think, mm, probably 50 lines, and I think it works really nicely, and now I can even compare these to, say, a different distance metric, and, uh, and start uh, interrogating the, um, 
the kind of biological effects that I, uh, that I see on this particular data set. So again, um, it's all interactive, it's all live, and it really didn't take us uh, that much time. And in Evident, or in this uh, other project, doing this same thing took us a lot more work, or, and it was a lot harder to maintain. So just to wrap up, um, Emperor is ready to be used. We, as of yesterday, we released uh, our first beta, so that I think deserves uh, celebration. And um, we're very proud of having these available in Conda and PIP. It was, um, it was an entire journey to learn how to use these uh, tools, but uh, we encourage you to try this out. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be around uh, during the sprints. And finally, I would like to acknowledge all of our users. Um, to this date, according to uh, Google Scholar, we've been cited around 99 times. Um, and to the, uh, the, the amazing people that I get a, a chance to work with and that, get a, uh, that, that have helped me uh, or helped us develop this uh, tool. So thanks. <laughs> um, yes, <laughs> it's a surprise. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'll be champagne and confetti. Yeah. Do you have any more ideas of other evidence-like tasks that you could now wrap into Emperor that were previously off the table with a evidence-based? Yeah, so I think. Um, one of the really cool uh, things that we could start doing, and especially with uh, something like Chime Studio, is become aware from the context of Emperor about other sort of visualizations. So for example, you go to one of these plots and you click in one of these samples and instead of just seeing um, the name of a sample or just being restricted to this interface, I think we should be able to go on to different types of views. Maybe you want to see a taxonomic summary of uh, what sort of taxa are present in, these, uh, in this particular sample. Or you select a few set of samples and see the distribution of alpha diversity in these uh, samples. So I think things that integrate in different levels is the way to go. And uh, I think we, we can support that, those use cases. <coughs> Oh, fantastic. Oh, awesome. Fantastic. Well, no thanks. other questions, but thanks for your sheet too again.